Agency is a word you don't often hear if you aren't looking for it. To understand one's own heart and to have the wherewithal and ability to act on that heart's desires are the integral final pieces to becoming a whole human being. But we put aside those necessary revelations about who we are and what we're capable of, what we can do to make ourselves not just happy, but content in our own existence for a variety of reasons. We tell ourselves we are too poor. We tell ourselves we are too stupid. We tell ourselves we were born wrong, born small, born broken, and that we cannot change what we are. Today's story is about a girl born into a life of dirt, but who desires to spring forth from the rich earth of her homeland to become a woman capable of anything. A woman with agency such as will shake the world. And, of course, the Diosito, who helps her along the way. Hola y bienvenidos a los West Side Fairy Tales. Soy Tyler Bell, el escritor, narrador y productor del cuento que vas a escuchar. Para mis hermanas y hermanos que hablan español, este cuento usa un poco de la idioma española. Mi español no está muy bien, pero espero que no sea insultante. Gracias por tu idioma hermosa, que estoy honrado que hablar. For those of our listeners who don't understand Spanish, hello and welcome to the West Side Fairy Tales. I'm your host, Tyler Bell, the writer, narrator, and producer of the story you're about to hear. But before we get into all that, I'd like to introduce you to some things I didn't make that you might be interested in. This month's literature recommendation is The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Largely held as one of the most important works of Mexican-American literature, Cisneros' 1983 novel explores themes of violence, sexuality, and growing up, amongst dozens of others, in a series of easy-flowing vignettes surrounding the main character's childhood on the eponymous Mango Street. The stories are all short, simple, and powerful. I was half worried I wouldn't get into the story until a short aside about a quiet boy deciding a random fluffy cloud in the sky is God. Cisneros' Mango Street is a quick, evocative read, and I really can't recommend it enough. If you end up trying it, you'll probably finish it in an afternoon. I'll leave a link to where you can find it in the description. This month's random horror recommendation is the 2007 found footage horror film Wreck by Jaume Balguero and Paco Plaza. That's R-E-C, Rec, as in record, by the way. The film follows reporter Angela Vidal, her crew, a team of firefighters, and a couple of police all trapped in an apartment complex when the building is quarantined due to an outbreak of some unknown disease. It's soon discovered that people afflicted with the disease become irrationally violent and that the disease itself can be transferred through bodily fluids or bites and, well, even the most fair-weather horror fan can tell where this is going, right? Wrong. <laughs> sort of. Rec builds a sort of survival detective story as the uninfected members of this motley crew are pushed further and further up the multi-story building toward the ominous Patient Zero's apartment on the top floor. Tensions rise as more facts are revealed about that apartment building and what its tenants and the authorities actually know about what's happening. It's a great movie and usually available for streaming here or there. I absolutely recommend the movie and must caution you ahead of time that there's an awful American remake called Quarantine that you should avoid at all costs. I'm going to dive more in-depth on these two titles in two weeks for the West Side Fairy Tales Horror Lit Club, a long-form, off-the-cuff discussion podcast I do on this same channel. I'll talk a little bit more about that after the end of the episode. Now, without further ado... This month's story, Ojos Oscuros. When I was a child, I lived in an agave field. We lived in the highlands, east of Guadalajara, where the ground is low and flat and brown. It stretches to the horizon in all directions until all you can see is the rocky dirt and the sky and the agave. You have never seen agave, because I brought myself to America long before you were born, but it is nothing special to look at. 
The leaves are long, thick, flat, and barbed at the edges like saw blades. They grow taller than a child, sometimes tall as a man. Spiny things that erupt from the earth in slow motion over a decade, longer even, before they are harvested. We lived amongst these formidable things in a shack my father's father had built as a hideaway during one of the revolutions. It doesn't matter which, only that he came to hide on this land and, in so doing, passed the destiny of our insignificant brood into the hands of Don Martino and his family, the Martinez clan. Don Martino died in my father's thirtieth year and passed control of the land, the agave, and our lives into the hands of his son, Don Javier Bello Martinez. The entirety of that family were criminals. Their patriarch, Don Martino, robbed stagecoaches and trains in Texas before escaping American justice to return to his ancestral homeland. In truth, Martino was nothing more than a peasant, like I was growing up, born a bastard to some nameless woman in Guadalajara. He adopted the surname of Martinez in the old way to pass a sort of legitimacy down to his children, which all of them squandered in time, except one of his granddaughters. But I will tell you her story much later. I tell you all of this because you do not know what it is to be a peasant. You know poor... You understand impoverished your mother has told me you have aspirations to help the poor and indigent of this nation, people who look like you and who, by that logic, you think you have some brotherhood with. I will not dissuade you from this. It's not my place, and, anyway, I believe it's as good a way to pass the years as any. Better than most, in fact. But what you must know is that you have no understanding of what it is to be a peasant. To be a peasant is to be below, to be beneath. There is always the understanding that there are real people, the people who wear fresh clothing and go where they please, and those people are above you. And so you think at least the animals are beneath me, but you would be wrong, because every well-bred horse and dog is above you. And so you might think, well, at least the plants growing from beneath my own dirty feet are beneath me. And you would be wrong, because still there is the agave. I walked with my father through the rows of agave the day this story begins, truly begins, listening as he pointed out plants to me one after another and told me what was happening the year and day they were planted. This one, he said, was planted when President Carranza had Zapata assassinated. You can see in the color and the size that it's ready to be harvested. Eight to twelve years, Abeya. Then they're ready. He held out his hand and I handed him the koa, what you might think to call a hoe if you've never seen it used, though there's really no English word for the thing. Imagine a spear, but instead of a point, the blade is a flat disc just this much smaller than a dinner plate. The disc is kept sharp along the forward edge and it's with this tool we harvested the agave. Father worked the great plant out of the ground, wedging it up and cutting away the roots that lay beneath the soil. Then he chopped the long saw blade arms away one by one, until all that was left of the thing was a great, round ball. The piña, Mosimadores called this, because it looks like a pineapple. But my father, he called this part the corazón, the heart. I think you are strong enough for the harvest, eh, Abeya? he said turning to me and handing over the koa. His hands were broad and flat and very rough, though my father himself was not a large man. He wore a faded burlap patch over his right eye where a bullet had smashed into his cheek as a young man. The traces of a crude eyeball I had drawn there with chalk years earlier still lingered. Yes, Papa, I said, taking the koa from him. I had followed him through the fields for years, watching him work and carrying water and occasionally dragging the agave hearts to our little wagon for loading. I had held this crude, sharp tool a thousand times before, but only now did I feel the weight of it. It was by this thing, but of my father's labor, that our family ate. He saw in my eyes that I understood the responsibility he was passing to me, and smiled. 
His remaining eye was very dark, though it twinkled brightly in the shadows beneath the ruinous weaving of his sombrero. Beneath that he had the same thick mustache that most men found fashionable at the time, though he grew his wide at the sides to cover the scars of his ruined cheek. Other than that, he wore the simple cotton trousers and linen shirts afforded us by the kindness of the Martinez clan, whose land we worked by the mercy and grace of God. Oh, and he wore a crucifix, which was more dangerous in those times than you might ever imagine. I worked for the next hour or so in the fields, straining my child's body to its limits to show my father my value as a worker. I fell into a rhythm, chopping the agaves down to the hearts as he carried them to the wagon. All the while he sang songs I knew half the words to, and I would try to sing along with him. Before the sun began to set, we had maybe thirteen hearts packed between the worn wood slats of the wagon. They were so heavy that our mule, Grovier, stamped in consternation with every weighty thump. Father lifted the water jug from Grovier's side satchel and set it atop one of the hearts as I fitted the back door of the wagon into place. He stretched his arms, rubbed his back, and then took off his sweat-stained shirt and laid it out across the side walls of the cart to dry a bit. I followed suit on the other side of the wagon, relishing the feel of the sun wicking the sweat off my shoulders. I set my own straw hat, a child's hat now almost too small for me, atop one of the hearts and chuckled to myself at the thought of a little piña man going into town wearing such a thing. My father laughed himself and turned around to see what I was going on about. He had been standing with his back to me, so I could see the lines of purple scar traveling left to right over his spine. He made a noise I would have laughed at when he saw me, if it hadn't scared me so badly. A sort of gasp choked off as he inhaled the bit of water he'd been drinking. He turned back around quickly and waved a hand blindly behind him. At me. Abea, he said. For the love of God, put your shirt back on, girl. He cast his eye to the ground, and I stood dumbfounded for a moment. The sun no longer felt so good, but hot and depressive instead. I looked down at myself and saw the two small lumps of flesh that had only just started pushing out of my chest. In the deep brown of my skin, I could never see the blush that suffused me, but I felt that hot creep of blood crawling just beneath the surface of me from head to toe. I grabbed the shirt and pulled it on quickly, tightly, pulling my familiar old work shirt tightly across my chest like a shawl. The agave stood vigil around us, the knife shapes of their silhouettes slashing at the last tangerine hints of the sun. My shirt was thin and wet. It smelled of dirt and sweat and agave sap. I didn't dare turn around until the soft scent of tobacco smoke filled the air. My father still not looking at me, stood beside Grovier with his hand on the mule's neck. The stubborn animal stamped and tossed baleful looks back in my direction, but otherwise remained quiet. The polished crescent beneath the rim of the koa shone orange from where my father had rested it atop the pile. Not knowing what else to do, I stepped up beside my father, and we quietly returned home. That night I sat outside our little home, that pile of mismatched wood my father had done his best to keep from falling over all these years, and I watched the moon. I had forsaken the simple pants and shirt I almost always wore for some of my mother's old clothes, a simple brown dress and a blouse with an orange woolen poncho. It was the time of year when the heat of the day gave way to terrible cold at night, and like my own wet work shirt earlier that day, I pulled the poncho tight around myself and tried to become small and unnoticeable. The clothes were warm, but uncomfortable. The fit was fine enough. My mother was no larger or smaller than me at that age, but they were not clothes I was comfortable in. They felt impractical and fragile, as though anything might ruin them at any time. The fit was such that I felt I was drowning in the clothes, rather than wearing them. Even then, I thought perhaps that was preferable to the odd look my father had given me. I had given honest effort to speaking with my mother about the odd exchange while father was up at the Martinez clan's palatial hacienda, dropping off the agave hearts, 
but it was a waste of my time. My mother, God bless her heart, was a stupid and cowardly woman, the sort who loathed to think and loathed even more any who tried to make her think. She realized fairly quickly that some tension had built between my father and I during our work in the field once we returned. Her matronly reaction had been to busy herself with the washing and cooking at the back of the house. A necessary chores, of course, but welcome distractions. I had tried to make myself useful to my father, but he had shrugged me off, sparing me only one worried glance before giving the card a once-over and heading up to the hacienda. For years I had followed along with him after a harvest. I liked walking through the high gates and over the well-swept orange and brown tiles that led to the tequila distillery at the back of the property. Serious men lounged here and there throughout the place, and beautiful women who were always caked in makeup and perfume and smelled and looked like roses. They would always smile at me, and sometimes the men would offer me cigarettes, though I had taken to turning them down after the first, and last, time I tried smoking. But this night my father left me behind, behind with my mother, who spoke little and thought less who stirred at pots of rice and pots of laundry and did nothing of note save pass as a shadow through the small spaces of our house. I tried to speak with her several times, as I said, and the last was met with a simple revelation. Perhaps you have something to do outside, she suggested, stopping in her stirring and moping for just a second. Like father earlier that day, she didn't deign look directly at me simply tilted her head slightly in my direction. At best I saw the faintest brown crescent of her eye, and then I was outside. And I sat out there for a long while, curled up in the folds of my mother's old dress and listening to the night, flying things and creeping things, coyotes howling somewhere in the hills to the west, all of them mixed with the steady rush of the wind through the broad leaves of the agaves which twitched to the gentle rhythm of the desert air. But beneath all these things, at the time I thought the noise was only in my mind, another sound stood in cacophonous opposition to nature. Chuckling is what it was. Not laughing. Chuckling. As if at some sick joke. I thought at first it was my mother but the sound was too mad for such a boring woman to make, and too masculine anyway. It was the voice of perhaps a young man, the sort who was just a touch older than me, and always getting into trouble. Most incredibly, I realized, it was coming from beneath my family's little house. I turned so fast I stumbled over my skirts and tumbled over myself and ended upside down and staring into the darkness under the house. The space there was a simple crawl space, filled with little more than dirt and a few odd rusting farm implements father had either only a rare use for or no use at all. But in that space of twisted shadow I saw something that caught my heart and my throat. The moon was very bright that night and full, and the soft gray light that found its way beneath my house caught in the wet blackness of two large eyes. The eyes of no animal on this earth, though in that moment I thought my throat was in immediate danger of being torn out by a ranging mountain lion. Then it laughed at me. You look like a fool, it said. I remained still. Like a fool, I had laid on my stomach to see better under the house, and now I was in no position to push myself away and run. As if sensing this, it spoke again. No need, little darling. And a little paw, like that of a cat, though attached to an appendage seemingly devoid of bones, slipped from the very edge of the shadow and laid over my wrist. It was simultaneously warm and chill, like the bottom of a hot pan filled with ice and covered in fine black hair, like a kitten's hair, almost. Please don't hurt me. I said to it. In those times, in that land of arid flatness, old superstitions still held in the hearts of the people. None matched perfectly with what I was seeing, with what I was speaking to in the shadows beneath my family's home. But still that feeling remained. A sort of grandness in the heart, like falling off a great cliff. 
the knowledge that you are suddenly face to face with legend, with the arcane, that you are in conversation with something beyond your own little self. No, it said, its teeth tiny and sharp and black, caught in the moonlight sometimes as it spoke, but otherwise remained invisible. The creatures spoke a soft, lisping, and very old sort of Spanish. And it was Spanish, from the old continent, the tongue of the conquistadors, not the weathered dialect you might call Mekano. I would not hurt you for a million reasons, little dear one, it said. You are safe when you speak to me. Why? I asked him, for it seemed to me this thing was male, and even in this retelling I think, perhaps, it would be rude for me to refer to him otherwise. Because I see the strings, he said. My mother told me how a long time ago. His paw slid under my wrist the two black claws at the end of it scratching gently at the soft flesh on the underside of my arm, making the cloth there feel worthless and immaterial. The pads of his fingers rested in my palm for the briefest second, and then were gone back into the shadows. The strings touch every part of this land, he continued. They dangle from the leaves of the agaves here and stretch into your home. They are wrapped like cord around the throats of your father and mother. They hang like nooses over the arches of the hacienda on the hill. He chuckled. But they don't touch you. I don't know what you're talking about, I told him. You do, he replied. But not just now. Like I said, I see the strings, and I see you having this conversation now and remembering it years after, and thinking long and hard on it years after that. I see you as all sorts of things, sitting around and thinking about my words, a doctor, a criminal, a mother. A doctor, I blurted. An image had formed in my mind with such clarity it stole my breath. It was me, an old woman, standing over a plastic bed covered in white sheets, where a man with a missing arm was sweating out a terrible fever. I didn't even know what plastic was, but there it was in my mind, as sudden and sharp as a knife to the heart. I found I was holding my breath and exhaled. So that is what you'd like to be, eh? He said. I looked into the eyes of this terrible little thing beneath my house and nodded, terrified, my own eyes nearly as wide as his. Like the tide sweeping back out to sea, I felt the other memories, held by the woman I might become, filling my mind. One was a mother, embittered by the world and as frightened and thoughtless as my own mother. The other was a violent, sneering woman, face more badly scarred and worn than my father's. But both of these thoughts were merely that, thoughts, memories, smudged windows obscuring the true image in the far distance. Me, an old woman, standing beside that strange and alien bed. Through these other, filthy versions of myself I saw my true and real future. I saw myself reading papers, in English of all things, attached to a board and resting my hand on the man's head. The man smiled and slept. You're going to die here, in this place, the thing said. His eyes were full of mirth despite the sentence he imposed upon me. Why do you say that? I asked. A spell had broken that I didn't even realize I'd been under. The visions of my future no longer seemed so real, so possible, so sure. Because I see the strings, he said. The statement was simple, matter of fact. You will be, at best, the criminal, a 
mother was the mother. His teeth shone again as he smiled. They were black and viciously curved, though I could see little else of him but the occasional tuft of hair. But I can help. How? Trade, he said. Fair trade. Three paws flitted to the air in front of my face, all at the ends of wriggling black arms. Five claws shone in the moonlight, two on each hand save one that remained retracted. You are a peasant now, a farmer, despite the lofty height of your future, so I will trade you for harvest. Harvest? I asked, and he smiled. Five hearts, he replied. Not of the agave, you understand? I opened my mouth to speak and his wriggling arms wrapped around my wrist, dragging me deep into the shadows beneath the house. The air was cool and the dirt cooler, so that it felt like the great ice box in the hacienda. His body was an almost unbearable pressure on my chest, but it warmed me as the invisible parts of him wrapped tightly around me. I found the back of my own hand hovering just inches from my face. The brown of my skin almost glowed in the faint moonlight compared to the jet blackness of the creature resting on top of me. His teeth were more evident now, and I saw there were enough of them, long and sharp as they were, to tear a pig's head from its shoulders with a single bite if the mood struck. I thought to beg, but remained quiet. Five hearts, he said softly. The strings don't touch you, but they should, you understand. Something has conspired to shuffle you loose, to steal your destiny. He chuckled. But I am a hungry Diosito, and perhaps they didn't know I was watching you. That their little machination spun such chaos into the threads that their deception has been writ large across reality. I don't know what you mean, I said, tears welling in my eyes. I thought my chest would break under the weight of him. His words smelled like blood and ripped meat. You will, he whispered. But to get to that point, I will have to unweave you. Five is the price, delivered in time, on credit, as they say. His claw found the back of my hand and cut deep into the flesh. The patron. Blood shone bright, brighter than anything in that dark space. It dripped onto my face, onto the corners of my lips. The matron. He continued, cutting me again and again with each name. The lover, the stranger, the fool. My own blood covered my face by the time he finished, so that I could barely open my eyes for how it burned them. The smell was overpowering. Do you accept? He asked. Yes, I whispered, and he pressed my own palm to my face, smearing the blood from my forehead to my chin. Then it's done, he said with a last long chuckle. When you are ready to pay, call my name. Look into the darkness and whisper, Sombrero. His face moved closer and closer to mine until I could feel his fur sticking to the gore on my cheeks. Then he licked me with a tongue longer and thicker than my forearm, gently, like a mother cat cleaning a kitten. The flesh of the organ was as hard as Grovier's thighs under a load and dappled with knobs like a pickle. The motion was so harsh it pulled my mouth and eyelids open several times. Then it was over, and he was gone. The pressure of him vanished without noise, and I crawled from beneath my house in a panic, taking several shaking steps without ever looking away from that shadowy space. This is how I came to nearly knock over my father, who cursed loudly and jumped when I slammed into him. He wrapped his hands around my arms and looked into my eyes. 
His own were painfully bloodshot and sick with worry, but about something other than me. What is it, Abeya? He asked. I looked behind me and then again at him. A man stepped out of the shadows and into the light coming from inside our house. A man I knew from some degree by my trips to the hacienda, though I could not place his name. His eyes were tight and tipped up with a laugh that seemed chained deep in his throat, strapped down just ever before the point of bursting. Our eyes met for the briefest second and I saw him grind his teeth, if only just a bit, biting down on that errant bit of joy to keep it controlled. Abea, my father said, repeating himself. He leaned forward so that I could see his eye again, the faintest touch of candlelight caught like a spark, but it otherwise remained dark. The faintly painted blue eye on the burlap covering the empty socket sat in shadow as well. I looked back and forth between both, not knowing what to say, what words might answer the question and not leave me looking mad or addled. A snake. I told him. I saw it go beneath the house. My father looked past me and the familiar man looked at me, those teeth crunching gently against each other. The light from the windows pulled over his face, dancing mad and orange, though the sky itself was green and deeply darkening over his shoulder. His eyebrows were thick and stood like mounds over the deep brown plains of his otherwise flat and angular face giving me the impression of an unfinished charcoal drawing. Time for that later, the man said, and by his voice I knew him. He was Paolo, the son of the Asendado, Don Martino. Their voices were perfect imitations of one another, differentiated only by age, the slight cracking of the gently rolled R's. I want to meet your family. They are my family as well, after all. My father gave one last look to the space beneath the house and then joined our somber procession inside. There is little to say of the dinner and drinks that followed. Paolo Martinez poured mescal down his throat as though he was trying to quench a fire, or perhaps start one, and my father kept up with him out of politeness. My mother and I retreated to her room and sat awkwardly as they passed stories between one another most of which Paolo happened to be the hero of, to some degree. Hero is a generous term here. Protagonist is probably more accurate. The man was a drunk and a gambler, and a proud murderer of other men in duels. He had a passion for starting fights on others' behalfs and then finishing them, only to swallow whomever he'd helped with the dead of the action. He considered all of this as a sort of philanthropy, to hear him tell it the noblesse oblige of the Mexican ruling class. But any simple child, even as I was then, could see he was little more than a chest-beating thug who enforced his father's whims on the people of the countryside. These self-absorbed stories existed only to be challenged, so that he might have a reason to slap the handle of the pistol he carried around and a black leather holster on his hip. Because at the true depths of this man, he was no hero or villain or any such thing. No. He was simply a boy who'd never been told no, who had never found a fruit too forbidden to savor, who had grown into a man living at the very edge of sanity, ever waiting for any reason to slip down into the black waters below. He stayed with us through the night, falling asleep in the communal room where I made my bed. I found him there with the dawn light seeping over him, painting his face orange where the floorboard beneath him remained dark, and almost green from wear. I made to quietly pick my work clothes off the ground, and his eyes snapped open suddenly, his hand whipping out to latch onto my arm. For a moment, I was reminded of that dark creature in the space beneath my house, the little animal with which I had made a deal I barely understood. The back of my hand was twisted up to my face again in that moment, though it was Paolo Martinez's angry eyes on the other side of it and not the large, smiling eyes of the one who called himself Sombrero. My hand was clean and uninjured, though I'd gone to bed the night before cradling the nasty cuts, hiding them in my skirts. Never 
sneak up on me, he said, tapping his incisors together twice. Click, click. This was followed by a slow grind of his teeth together throughout his mouth, the way another man might stroke his beard while thinking. I'm sorry, I said. No, you're not, he replied. You're lucky. He pushed my hand back at me and then laid back down as though I were not there at all. Now let me sleep. I obeyed him and got to work outside, taking care of Grovier's morning necessities and harnessing him to the cart. Mother came outside as well after a minute to tend to her own chores. We worked in silence, waiting for Father to show, though he never did. It seemed Paolo's mescal had done him in for the day. It was not the sort of tequila they made from our agaves. That was cheap stuff for farmers and Americans. In fact, most of what they made at the hacienda was headed for America before it touched the inside of a bottle. Don Martino's family sold it at four times its worth to American bootleggers in Texas, who would, in turn, inflate the stuff on its way further north. Look at this, Paolo said, stepping out of our house. Women hard at work. He smiled at me, tipping the flat brim of his hat to just over top his eyes. His jaw worked back and forth. I like that. Thank you, Don Martinez, my mother said reflexively, stopping her work for just a second to nod at him. He smiled. I said something in kind and went back to Grovier, petting the back of his neck and hoping my father would come outside so we could leave for the fields so I could leave this man. Oh, a koa, he said, picking my father's tool from the back of our cart and waving it around his head like an idiot. I've never really seen one up close before. No reason to, but I heard they cut through the agave like butter. He smiled at me, and his face opened up over that grin. His eyes opened up for just a second so that I couldn't help but see deep down into the core of him. I felt myself tightening my clothes around my chest the way I had the day before, stepping back toward Grovier. Then he lashed out with the koa, swinging it down in an arc I was sure would catch Grovier in the neck. I would have jumped in front of the sweet, stupid animal if I'd had the time, but thankfully I was still frozen in place by that hideous look on Paolo's face. Grovier whined as the koa struck home. But it didn't strike Grovier. Instead, I heard a steady, harsh rattling and the noise of gravel scattering away from the impact. I looked down to see the head and first twenty-odd centimeters of a rattlesnake wriggling madly away from the rest of its body. The head of the koa sat half-buried in the ground, blood from the snake streaking the dull silver disc in a perfect red stripe. I guess it works on snakes as well, Paolo said. The laugh he'd been biting down on all the day before cracked his throat wide open. It chilled me to the bone. When he laughed, it was like there was somebody squeezing something out of his chest, pumping it open and closed like a bellows. His eyes widened nearly as far as his mouth, and his head swiveled toward me. Then it was over. Done. Gone. I looked to my mother and saw she'd frozen in place. Her fingers shivered over the flatbread she'd been laying out to cook in the stone oven behind the house. I turned back to Grovier as the poor, stupid thing started stamping and squalling. It had only just begun to understand the presence of the snake. The noise of the snake's rattle, still going despite the decapitation, was driving him into a fit. Look at him go, Paolo said, poking the rattlesnake with a now bloody koa. The thing was flipping over itself and making feeble attempts to strike. The rest of its body had coiled into a perfect, circular pile so the head might soon rejoin the rest. Or perhaps, as though it had never left. Please, just finish it. I whispered, despite myself. Paolo gave me a look so condescending it made me blush, and then struck the snake again just behind the skull. It stopped struggling, and Paolo flicked it away toward the house. Then he spread out his arms and nodded his head slightly. You're welcome.
Several awkward minutes passed with Paolo inserting himself into our daily lives, asking foolish questions and being purposefully in the way. Then a stagecoach pulled onto the road alongside our house, coming down from the hacienda. Paolo stretched his arms and walked to it, setting his hands behind his head. A man and a young woman stepped out onto the ground. The man was Paolo's father, Don Javier Bayo Martinez, the acting head of the Martinez family. The young woman was Paolo's little sister, Maria. She frowned at her brother and then looked us over and waved. She was perhaps my age, a touch older even, but tremendously beautiful and well-educated in all the things that separated her from people like my family and the dirt we lived on. I waved back. My hand curled, wilted, even, when Paolo looked back at me and waved himself, thinking my hand was raised to him. For the third time, I felt myself wrapping my chest tighter in my sad old work clothes, a feeling I was beginning to hate. Then all of them were back on the carriage and bouncing away down the road, heading for some social engagement in Guadalajara, if I had to guess. I plucked my father's koa off the ground and cleaned the blood from the blade by rubbing it in the dirt. My father still hadn't woken by the time I sharpened the thing again. Still hadn't awoken by the time Mother had all but finished collecting the trash to burn in the pit behind the house. Perhaps her screaming woke him, though, when she picked up the severed rattlesnake head and the thing flipped in her hands and bit her on the wrist. I wouldn't know. I had eyes only for my mother and the insane dead thing gnawing mindlessly into the soft flesh of her arm. Its eyes were fully gray and clouded over, but even as I watched it pumped slow death into my mother. Even as I watched, it ended the life I'd always known. Though, if I'd have paid more attention, I'd maybe have seen the dark eyes glittering in the shadows beneath my family's home. Are you enjoying Ojos Oscuros? I hope so. And if you are, please consider taking a moment to pause the episode and head over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash westsidefairytales. The Westside Fairy Tales is, always has been, and always will be free. But donations from listeners like you help keep the lights on, so to say. It's how we pay for episode art, hosting, and the preemptive costs of things like merch sales. Giving us just a dollar today shows that you support independent horror and gets you early into ad-free access to episodes like this. More generous donations include access to special behind-the-scenes talks, merchandise giveaways, and special sales at the merch store. We hope you'll consider giving to the Westside Fairy Tales today at patreon.com slash westsidefairytales. Thank you for listening, and stay safe out there. She didn't die right away. That came later. But death set in her bones as sure as any strong thing roots in fertile ground. My mother's body had always been fertile ground for death. Even in my old age, I believe that's all she'd been given to from birth. Some small amount of suffering. And then death. The short months after the bite saw her lose her arm to the infection, even though she survived the venom. Then she lay in the back room of our house and stank and rotted, and never died. Father would lay with her in some attempt at normalcy, or perhaps because he knew no other option. Perhaps still it was to keep her from sleepwalking, which she did with some regularity, wandering blank-eyed through the kitchen and even outside to tend to chores, as though her missing hand weren't missing, dabbing fever sweat away with her stump. Father believed that better doctors could help her out in the city, but they were far beyond our means to afford. He would go to Guadalajara, to the missions in the countryside in his free time, begging for help to save his wife. Of the hundreds he talked to, only two ever humored him and visited Mother. The first, a country doctor, looked her over and then hugged Father for a long moment. They drank together after a long while, and then the man left and father spent the rest of the week cursing his name and sobbing at mother's bedside. The second man came at the recommendation of Don Bello, an expensive city doctor who smiled a lot and smelled like cigarettes and wet flowers. 
He was tall and thin and spoke with a painfully American accent that convinced Father he could cure death itself with the right amount of money. Perhaps that's even what he said, because soon my father was trying everything under the sun to scrounge together dollars. I won't waste your time with the details of these mild endeavors. They were stupid and ill-advised, and ultimately, every one to the last was completely futile, even the one that worked. Father began to leave me alone in the fields in the fourth month after the bite, mostly because he stopped coming home for days or weeks at a time. He would leave with Paolo Martinez in one of the little touring cars that people had begun driving around then. He would come home tired and drunk sometimes, and one time mistook me for my mother. He stopped me in the doorway and held me against himself in a way that wasn't... I guess you would say inappropriate, though it was too forward for a father to hold his daughter that way. His big hands pressed my face into the cigar and liquor stink of his shirt. He had begun wearing a pistol on his belt as well, and that dug into my hip painfully. I tried to push him away, but it didn't work. Nothing happened, save that he wept on me like a child. He called me by my mother's name and kissed my forehead gently, and then slumped back against the wall behind him and fell into a sweating, sobbing heap. A few days later, he was dead. There was little in the way of a funeral. Paolo and Maria Martinez came by the house with their father and a bloody little slip of burlap. My father's cheap eye patch, the blue eye there flecked with dry burgundy droplets. Don Martinez handed it to me with a somber expression, and then his daughter wrapped me in a hug. Thank you so much for the sacrifice your father made for our family, she said to me, pressing her pink perfect lips to my cheek. I'd never been kissed by somebody that beautiful, and so it came as a bit of a shock. She stepped away and Paolo took her place, teeth grinding so hard the sound was just slightly louder than the sweep of desert air blowing through the agaves. I'll be around to take care of you, now that your father's gone, he whispered in my ear before pressing his lips to my cheek. And I'd never been kissed by somebody that terrible before, and so it came as something of a shock. Paolo's sister saw how the kiss lingered and a sad look came over her face. She turned quickly and hopped into a carriage, her father glaring at his son and calling for him to follow. Then they left, just as they had the day of the bite, hopping onto their little carriage and bouncing away up the road without a care in the world. But not all of them, no. Paolo stayed behind to look after me, just as he promised he would. We stood beside my dying mother's bed, and then he sat beside her. Paolo's fingers slipped beneath her head and tilted it up to the light, rocking it back and forth. He shook his head and set her skull back into the concavity it had worn in the pillow. Sweat glistened on his hand and he wiped it off on the chest of her nightshirt. Then he looked at me. She's dying, he said. She's already dead, I said back to him, turning to leave. He grabbed my arm. Your father said her name before he died, Paolo said. His words were like oil in the humid quiet of the room. The only light came from a gas lantern he'd set beside the bed an amenity we'd rarely used in my father's lifetime. His face was mad and orange beside my mother's, which was pale and green and gray and all but bloodless. They made my stomach turn, those swirling, mixing colors. It felt like the hissing gas flame was sucking all the oxygen out of the room, making all the shapes dance and warp out of shape. Paolo's teeth cracked and ground behind his lips. His mustache was coal black and slicked into position with some sort of pomade I could see caked up around the edges of his lips. Some of the hairs were stained off color from cigarette and cigar smoke, which even now colored his breath and made me want to vomit. He reached up and twined his fingers through my hair. He said, Take care of Abella and Carlita. Paolo recited, his eyes dancing over my face. His grip tightened and he pulled me closer. He said, Carlita is sick, 
but your father knows a doctor that can make my wife better. Please, he leaned in. Please, Paolo, take care of my family. His other hand came up to rest on my hip, his fingers splaying up the small of my back. He pulled me closer. My mother's eyes fluttered beneath the lids like they had since the amputation, since the doctor had put her under and cut her arm off and finished what the snake started. Well, almost finished. Before her, clouding all the right of my vision, was the face of a man I barely knew. Paolo. The man with the tight eyes and insane sudden laughter. His teeth cracked left to right. Snake crunch. Crack. I said nothing. I didn't know what to say. I'm going to take care of you now, he said. I was now close enough to see the shape of my own face highlighted in his eyes. And your mother, of course. But you, I like you. I think you hate me, and I like that. Father said you're too young, but you're a rimadora, aren't you? Twelve years, you know. That's almost too old to harvest an agave, isn't it? He pressed his mouth and that black, reeking mustache to my lips and I bit him. I wasn't even planning to, it just happened. He slapped me, kicked me, and slapped me some more. He started laughing as he did it, that same terrible laugh from when he'd beheaded the snake. It ended abruptly and he dragged me to my feet. I stood shaking and meeting his gaze as evenly as I could. I watched him pull the laughter back into himself, button it up and lock it back in his throat. His teeth clicked a few times. Don't you want to take care of your mother? He said. He finished the sentence with a little hiccup of a chuckle. She'll die without a doctor. A good one, like only a man like me can afford. She's already dead. I said, glaring at him. He cocked up an eyebrow and pulled that mad laughter even deeper into himself. Then he grabbed my mother's throat and squeezed. The reaction was slow, but after a moment she began to cough and wheeze. Her hand slapped feebly at his wrist. He released her. No, she's not. He said. His hand moved lower and he grabbed her breast beneath the tatty blanket that covered her. It had been a happy thing in its past, brilliantly green and yellow and red. But time and mother's sickness had grayed the woven cord. Now it looked no cheerier than a child's funerary shroud. Mother moaned and tried to shrug away, her eyes opening and looking at me. They found the shape of her daughter in that room and gazed balefully. There was a cry for help there, I'm sure, but I steeled myself against it. I had eyes only for Paolo. Let me get some of you, and I, I won't take any of her, he said. She still works the way a, a woman needs to. He let my mother go and bent over me. Though he wasn't a tall man, short by American standards, he still towered over me at twelve. But I want that sweet, ripe piña. Understand? I want you. <laughs> My sharp, little agave. He touched my chin and I could do nothing but glare. Please leave, Don Martinez. I told him, there's nothing for you here. He let go of my chin and slapped my cheek, but lightly. The sensation wasn't too painful, in truth, but it sent an electric chill down my spine that sickened me. The room stank of him and my dying mother. Perhaps my own terrified sweat as well. Though above all else was the smell of him. Of this man. This creature. This thing. Everything on earth is for me. He said. Then he left. Calling back over his shoulder to me. My father expects his agaves himadora. I stepped outside when I was sure he'd left. When I was positive, he wouldn't snatch me by my hair and throw me to the ground outside my family's home. But out in the cool night air, there was only the agaves and the sky. 
and Grovier's gentle, steady breaths as he slept in his tiny stable. I walked to the side of the house and sat before the shadows beneath it, and I said his name. Sombrero, I called. Yes, he said. There was no motion before he spoke, nothing to suggest he'd been anywhere but there since the night I'd spoken to him. Are you real? I asked. Possibly, he replied. His eyes opened and I saw them shining in the moonlight. What is and isn't real in this world sits on either side of a faint line. It grows fainter every year. Perhaps soon it will go entirely. I took a breath and pulled my father's eye patch from my pocket. I held it to my chest and squeezed it in my hand. Though it was little more than burlap and chalk, I felt as though I held his entire body, his entire life in my hands. I cried, despite myself, and Sombrero said nothing. This, I said in time, holding out my father's eye patch. The creature's little two-clawed hands snaked from the shadows and wrapped carefully around the blood-stained burlap. He tugged at it, and I felt the pull throughout my body. Then he pulled harder and the fabric scratched my hands and was gone, along with something deep at the core of me. I felt a trickling coldness in my chest. I accept, he said, any trace of a chuckle was gone. Though you have paid in different currency than I expected, the rate of exchange is even. His mouth opened and I saw the sad flap of burlap disappear between his black teeth. And then it was gone. I hissed as something burned into the back of my hand and, looking down, I saw one of the vicious rents Sombrero had left reopened in my skin. It bled freely into the dirt, a single straight line from my wrist to center knuckle. I licked the blood away without thinking and saw the cut had already sealed itself, though an ugly purple scar remained. I stood. Four more, Sombrero said. I nodded and went inside to Mother. She lay in a pool of her own sweat, eyes barely open, skin so gray she looked like a filthy white woman. I sat at her bedside, feeling a clarity I hadn't known before just then. I saw her, still beautiful despite the sickness, though just as dull and uninspired all the same. She would never be useful to me or herself ever again. Mother, can you hear me? I asked. She nodded slowly. Can you walk? She shook her head. It was my turn to nod. I need to take you outside. I will carry you, but it may not be comfortable. She nodded again and tried to speak, though her words were little more than a rasp. I understood her on her second try. Where is your father? She asked. And then again, Where is he? Let's go find him, I said. I carried her outside on my back, the blanket trailing along behind her as we went. She was so tangled in the thing I didn't bother trying to work her free of it, and he kicked up a small cloud of dust that lingered in the night air. That same dust speckled her gray cheeks as I laid her beside the house. Her hand lingered at my neck for just a second before I let go of her, her untrimmed nails scratching at the skin. Not so deeply yet, I thought, grabbing my father's koa from beside the house and standing next to her. She was looking at me, her eyes misted with confusion and fear. The silver crescent of the koa hung just over my shoulder shining down on her like a second moon. Close your eyes, Father, I told her, and she did. I was not as strong as my father then, as a child, when I killed my mother in the dirt and shadows beside our house in the agave fields. But I had worked with him for years by then, and my muscles, my hands, were trained as well as any young himador. My father could have struck through to the earth below on a single well-placed strike. 
It took me too. Though my hand slipped on that second blow and I fell sobbing over my shivering, rasping mother. I turned to her face and held it in my hands. Her own hands, forgetting the fatigue of her illness, rose to the sky. She worked her fingers open and shut, clutching at something only she could see. She tried to speak as well, despite the blood bubbling out of her throat. He is there, Mama, I said to her. Go, go to him, quickly. I could not bear to see the madness in her eyes, the fading color as death gently suckled the life out of her bones. I put my head against her chest and kept it there, listening to the rhythm of her heart grow harder, louder, and then emptier and softer until there was no rhythm at all, simply the last soft beat of a loose drumhead. Her arms, which had flown up beside my head in her death throes, fell over my back with a soft thud. I would like to think it was her last embrace of a sullen and thankless daughter. But they fell as they did because my arms were beneath her still, and positioned so that my hands cradled her face. Even knowing that, I let myself pretend for a long moment. The moment ended, and I stood, looking to the shadows. I found my father's koa and opened my mother's chest with it, calling for sombrero after I finished. This butchery took more effort than the killing, and I fell on my bottom when I was done. Blood soaked the earth around me, thickening the dirt to a tacky mud that stank of copper and death. Slender arms crept from beneath the house and disappeared inside my mother's chest. Then they pulled her heart into the shadows and were gone. Paolo found me amongst the agave a few days later. I don't know where he went in that time or what he did, and don't and never will care. But he found me all the same, walking through the field of green daggers with a damp cloth pressed to his forehead and a cadre of men at his heels. All of them I had seen at one point or another in the past, often in the halls of the hacienda or by the tequila plant behind it. They dressed too dark for the thickening summer heat, and all of them wore guns and ornate holsters. Don Paolo, I said as they approached, wrapping my arms around the koa, my koa, and resting the way I'd seen my father do a thousand times before. It was noon, and I'd already filled half the wagon with piñas. Sweat soaked through my clothing head to toe, making my shirt cling to me. In maybe half an hour I would have dropped it entirely, as I had been doing in the days since my mother's death, working bare-chested in the mid-afternoon sun and letting it wick the moisture from my shoulders. Abeya, he said, stopping a few meters away with his hands on his hips. His fingertips brushed the tooled black leather on the holsters at his hips like he were some sort of cowboy. The guns themselves were shining chrome and pearl things too reflective to look at in daylight. Where's your mother? He chuckled, and his laughter flowed into the men around him like poison. He raised his hands to his sides. I brought my friends uh, around to see her, to wish her well, see if we couldn't find a way to, to raise those funds she needed for the doctor. My mother is gone, I said plainly, smiling warmly at him. I bent to pick one of the severed agave leaves off the ground and then pulled out my father's old work knife to strip a few sections away. The koa remained in the crook of my arm. I placed the strip of agave in my mouth and chewed. It was terribly bitter. Gone? Paolo asked. His eyes lowered. Gone where? Gone, I replied. Where all things go. I smiled at him around the thick slice of agave in my mouth and swallowed the bitter juice. Some of the swagger had gone out of his men. They looked around the agave field. She's... she's dead? He asked. She died? For a moment, the laughter swelling a knot in his throat faded. It made him seem empty. I nodded. Now the men began to grumble. A few even looked bored, tossing glances back to the relative cool of the hacienda. But Paolo had eyes only for me. 
I could see him working things over, a new play, a new plan. But he couldn't see as I had begun to see. What do you want with my mother, anyway? I asked, letting the koa slip down to my side and walking up to him. His teeth gritted side to side as I stopped just out of arm's reach and pulled a strip of agave out of my mouth. You know, agave gets bitter if you let it grow too long. It gets bitter. I put the half-chewed strip of agave in his mouth, slowly, tracing his teeth with it until he bit down. But if you harvest it at just the right time, it's very sweet, isn't it? Paolo's insane eyes widened, and he raised a hand to touch me, but I stepped just out of his reach and touched his chest with the blade of the koa. I have work to do, Don Paolo, I said, turning and going back to my cart. Grovier threw baleful glances at the assembled men as I stripped off my shirt and got back to work. I never looked at them myself, but I heard Paolo cursing one of them that decided to whistle at the sight of my naked back. Then they left, the sound of their boots crunching over the dirt fading into the steady dull rush of the wind amongst the agaves. And I set myself to my work the long, arduous, and patience-testing process of bringing the agave to harvest. I remembered again the bitter taste, and swallowed. Paolo came to me that night, and I gave myself to him. It was rough and awkward and terrible, but eventually it ended. I had not grown up around other girls, other people really, save for my mother and father. There were no preconceptions in my mind about what to expect from sex. All I knew about my body was that my father was afraid of it, and that Paolo desired it terribly. What I knew about the act itself was that Paolo expected it to hurt me to some degree, that it might remove some part of me and transfer it to him. He saw it as some theft he expected me to be the victim of, and that I was such a foolish and simple thing I liked to be robbed in that way. I let him believe that because it suited my purposes. In truth, the feel of him was little more than a chore I got used to. Working in the fields hurt worse and demanded more of me than laying with him in my mother's bed. He would get rough as well, slapping my body, pulling my hair, but I had cut myself a dozen times and weathered a thousand blisters out there amongst the agave. My threshold for pain My endurance was far beyond his cruel and boyish ministrations. When he was done, after he fell over top me, gasping and cursing, he would talk to me about himself. We would lay in a pile of sweaty sheets on my dead parents' bed and he would tell me about his family and their business. Men he had killed and intimidated family members his father didn't trust. He would tell me the iniquities and weaknesses of himself, his father, and his sister, though he would often say little about her. When he did, it would be in hushed and reverent tones. In the mornings I would wake and go to the fields, working as I always did, strengthening myself in that field of knives. He would remain at home in my parents' bed, still stinking from what we'd done the night before, and I would cleanse myself with sweat and sunlight. Then I would return at night and the process would repeat. He'd fuck me and gasp and curse and then talk. This routine was broken only twice before it ended entirely. The first interruption was at the beginning of the second month, a few weeks after I celebrated my thirteenth birthday by pretending it never happened at all. I slipped my way out from beneath his arm and readied myself for the day, eating and drinking coffee and dressing. I was harnessing Grovier when a terrible nausea struck me, and I had to rush to the side of the house to vomit. Waves of sickness came over me throughout the day, and I had to stop working several times to rest myself in the shade. That night I was too unwell to roll with Paolo the way he liked. I was sullen and unwell. He pawed at my body and fulfilled his little needs anyway, and after we finished he gave me a long and cold look. Usually... After he finished with me that sickening click-clack of his grinding teeth, the trapped laughter, it would fade. He would be like a normal human man, for all the pros and cons of that diagnosis, 
at least for a few hours. By this night he just stared at my body, looked me over and up and down, eventually settling on some consensus with himself. Then he dressed and left without a word. It was a couple months before I saw him again, even though I was up at the hacienda nearly every day. When I'd first started sleeping with him, he'd sometimes ambush me after I dropped off the day's penis, groping me in the storage room and following me back to my parents' dismal home like an excited dog. But he would never try to actually go all the way while on the grounds of his family home, nor would he carry on in the usual loud and grotesque manner about what he planned to do with me. In those intervening months, I would walk through a hacienda so empty it seemed like a ghost town. I knew from the way the few people I spoke with reacted to me that Paolo had laid some sort of hex on me to keep others away. There was only one person on the grounds who would dare speak to me in that odd, lonely time. The only way to describe her appearance was that she fluttered out of the house. That daughter of the Martinez clan, Maria, came dressed in flowing white silk that complemented her dark hair and soft features well. Her brother told me I was beautiful which I suppose was true because of the way he acted toward me. But next to this girl, I was a creature of dirt. I dipped my head to her. Doña Maria, I said respectfully, continuing to lead Grover out of the hacienda. The girl put her hand on my arm and I stopped. She put her hand on my chin and moved my face to hers. We had the same dark brown eyes, though hers seemed so large and doe-like because of her light complexion. I was brown as old wood from working in the harsh sunlight all the time, my skin rough from the wind. I am so sorry, she said to me. She pulled me in for a hug I never expected, and I pushed away reflexively to keep her fine white clothes from getting dirty. She held on to me anyway, and I felt her stomach against mine. It was just as swollen as mine had grown, more so even so that I understood why she was wearing so much clothing in the near dead of summer. My own stomach had only just started to show. He... She started, resting her forehead against my chin so that I could have kissed her forehead if I wanted to. I half expected that might have been her desire, but the moment passed and she buried her face in my neck. I saw one of the men who worked the agave kilns looking down the hill at us. Maria was sobbing. If it wasn't me, it was going to be somebody else. And even that wasn't enough for him. Doña Maria, I said. People are watching. Please. She stiffened and sniffed and backed away, comporting herself as best she could. Tears fell over her cheeks with all the simple beauty of a raindrop slipping down the side of an agave leaf. I plucked one off her skin and dried it on my dirty shirt. Then I nodded to her and tugged Grovier to get him moving again. I'm going away soon, she called after me. If you ever need anything from me, anything, please just let me know. I stopped and turned back to her, Grovier halting and grumbling beside me. He bumped my leg with his snout and snorted, eager to get home. I tapped his backside and turned to Maria Martinez, now my sister of sorts, and smiled. I will, Doña Maria, I said, nodding my head. Thank you. I will. Paolo returned to me just days later, and we resumed as though nothing happened, though he was drunk nearly every day. The stink of alcohol on him reminded me of my father near the end. My memory of him in this time is the stench of mezcal and his grunting, grinning face painted orange by the gas flame. His face, hanging over me and smothering my mouth and scratching my neck with his little beard hairs. It was a month still until he finally brought up the incident with his sister. We were both naked on the bed, his eyes wide and staring into the darkness beyond the window. The gas flame danced as always, and behind him were the dense blue interior shadows of my dead parents' home. My stomach was beyond hiding, beyond ignoring and his eyes stole to the swell of flesh over my hips. He traced his fingers over it. This is mine, he said. Any other girl I'd have an excuse for, but you've been mine and only mine as well. 
The tight laughter in his throat hiccuped out, making his whole body jerk. I know you talked to my sister. I did, I said. I have people all over, <laughs> all over this land tell me everything, he said. And I'd have no reason to lie to you, even if you didn't, I told him, stretching my legs and pulling the covers over my hips to keep warm. Cold wind blew through the window despite the summer heat. A promise of rain. She is going to leave me, he whispered. His jaw clicked and his eyes returned to the window. Father is sending her to America to have the baby. Some boarding school for unmarried pregnant girls. His fist clenched. He's taking her away from me. Does he know? I asked. Paolo shrugged. Family is, f is family, he replied. Father will have a grandchild, and that's all that matters. If my sister needs a husband, he'll invent one for her. He turned and smacked the bed. But she? Her and her child? They're mine. The same hand crept over the mattress to my body and squeezed what could be squeezed. This is mine. This and this. He had me again and then dressed himself. He took a long second adjusting the flat-brimmed black hat he liked to wear, staring again out the window. She's leaving tomorrow night, he said without looking at me. I'm going to drive her to the train. He sighed. Father doesn't want me to see her before she goes, but I told the driver to bring her here. That man is, <laughs> is my man, and he'll do what I say. And then, to himself, perhaps a last taste of her as well. He nodded. And what are you going to do all day? I asked. Linger around my house? If I want, he said, turning to me. He belched a laugh. Maybe I'll have some from, from both my ladies tomorrow. How about that? I shrugged. It doesn't matter to me, I told him. I was already thinking about other things. He walked to the window and rested his hands on the sill. His thumbs drubbed against the wood incessantly, impatiently. I'm going to keep you, though, he said, nodding again to himself. Then he turned. I have places in the country up north where, where you can go. Other houses. I, I can't have a son with some Kimodora, but if father can invent a husband for my sister, then I'll invent myself a wife. I turned on my side, letting my hand rest on the swell of my belly. His eyes were hideous as they looked me over. I'll be rich then? I asked. He nodded. And I'll live in a big house with servants, and I'll never have to work the fields. He nodded again, smiling this time, though his teeth cracked some as his jaw shifted. But what if I grow old? Won't you get sick of me? His smile faded, but he snorted up a laugh all the same. Then he came over to me and caressed my cheek. His hands were soft, like his sister's. You'll never grow old, Himadrita he said. His hand moved slowly over my face until his palm lay over my throat. He squeezed. Not ever. I woke and worked the next day, though I never ventured into the fields. Grovier stood beside me as I grew filthier and filthier. He stamped as the clouds rolled in, anticipating the coming storm. By the time the sun was setting, when Paolo rode up with his little cadre of foot soldiers, I was streaked head to toe with dirt. The thick sort of clay you get covered in when you dig deep. I watched them ride away from my place behind the house, and then stepped into the light where he could see me, completely naked and slightly swollen with pregnancy, covered in clay like some ancient native priestess. He stopped when he saw me, and I brushed a hand over myself. Look! I said to him, I'm filthy.
He took me into the agave, and I enjoyed him for the first and only time we were together, returning his savagery blow for blow. He was as naked and filthy as me when we finished, and I stood over top him. I can't let my sister see me like this, he said. No, and she won't, I said. Let me get something to fix you up with. He lay back, smiling, with his hands behind his head. I thought it odd he didn't scream when I severed his foot with the koa. There was a short, yelping laugh and then something like a howl. He clutched the leg above the cut where his ruined flesh still clung together in strips beneath the bone. Blood spread amongst the agaves. You fucking bitch, he said, or something like that. He tried to swipe at me with one of his arms, and I sidestepped and brought the koa down into the flesh at the joint of his right shoulder. The noise of the cut was no different than when I cut the leaves from the agave, save the odd, stuttering laughs coming from Paolo's throat. Another strike and the arm was off and laying in the blood and mud by Paolo's ass. He flipped forward and began crawling back toward my dead family's house, to where I had stripped off his clothes and where his guns lay safe and useless in their holsters. With an arm and most of a leg gone, he could do little more than slither his way over the ground. I watched him go, more concerned about Grovier whining in his tiny stable. I knew what he was thinking, watching Paolo crawl like that. Snakes make him nervous. I told Paolo. The man was laughing maniacally now, reminding me of the time he beat me at my mother's bedside. I stepped up beside him and raised the koa. But like you said, I guess this works on snakes as well. I buried the koa in the back of his neck, and his body stuttered and died, though he didn't stop laughing. In fact, it only got louder. His chin lay flat on the ground now, his throat stretched but yet to be severed. Blood covered his teeth and lips, and shot in little streamers out onto the ground in front of him. One last strike finished the job, and then I went to work, cutting him down to the piña, to the corazón. For this one I didn't need Sombrero's wandering arms. I pulled Paolo's steaming heart out of his chest myself. I held it in my hands and knelt beside my dead family's home and called to the creature that lived in the shadows there. His eyes opened. He took the offering. And he ate. The skin on the back of my hand split and bled tracks through the mud and clay. I put the rest of Paolo in the deep, slender hole I dug beside Grovier's pen and kicked some of the dirt over him. The last I saw of the man was his wide-open mouth and eyes filling with earth, still open in a last, mad laugh. His throat was finally unbuttoned, for what good it did him, and the skin of his face was dull green-gray as the rest of the mud around him. I heard a coach pull up and I went into the agaves, letting them hide me. I heard a short argument. Then a man's heavy footsteps followed by the small feet of a girl dropping down out of a carriage. She yelled after him, but his footsteps receded all the same. The storm threatened to break overhead. The last small traces of the sun had fled. I knelt, naked and streaked with blood and clay, amongst the agaves. Maria looked beautiful, as always dressed in white lace and high black riding boots with a little red flower in her hair. She looked young, too. Younger even than her real age of fourteen. A child with a child. A mother still in need of mothering. I stood and walked to where she could see me and the koa. My koa. Glimmering in the little light remaining to the day. Who are you? She asked when she saw me. Her eyes went wide with fear. She looked absolutely pitiful, adorable even, like a lamb given to God. I raised my hands and the koa to my sides. I am the dirt, I said, and the agaves. I am what your family eats to live. 
She backed against the wall of my house, her hands clenched in front of her chest. Abea? She asked. Is that you? Yes, I replied, moving ever closer. In the growing dark, she could see only me and the agaves, the whites of my eyes shining amidst all the blackness of what I'd done that day, the grime slicking my body head to toe. The storm cracked and showered us with rain. I raised my open eyes to the sky and let it fall cool and hard on my face and shoulders. Maria merely flinched. Where's my brother? she asked. I killed him, I said. Why? she asked, and I struck her in the throat with the koa. Her beautiful lamb's eyes widened in shock and pain. Rain slicked her hair to her face and the little red flower fell free to the ground. Her hands found the sharpened disc of the blade and she rent her fingers along the edges, trying to pull it free of her throat. I pushed harder, sending the blade all the way to her spine and pushing her body against the wall of my house. Her hands found the shaft of the caw and gave one last tug. Then she died, slumping down into the mud at my feet. I stripped her naked before butchering her, pushing the ruined dress down into the hole over top her brother. She lay naked and dead on the ground where I'd butchered my own mother, in much the same place. Her body was beautiful in its ruin. Her breasts were full and her stomach broad with the pregnancy. I stared down at that swollen lump for a while, touching my own stomach and thinking on the fate of my child's half-sibling. Then I cut open Doña Maria's chest and fed her heart to Sombrero. Two fresh lines of blood had joined the others on the back of my hand. The rush of killing the siblings, Maria and Paolo, had dulled the pain of the otherworldly cuts when they came. I only noticed them after, when they were nearly totally clean and all that remained were the nasty purple scars. There were four in a line now, all traveling from one knuckle of my hand to the wrist, a spot saved for the fifth along my thumb bone. This mark is called the Hand of Sticks when it is finished, but mine wasn't yet. That was a long time off, though on the night when I murdered those two I thought Maria's unborn child would count as the fifth. But, for whatever reason, it didn't. I walked naked in the rain, having buried Maria and Paolo, and pushed the rest of the dirt over them, and let the falling water wash me clean. I dug through some of Maria's luggage and brought it into my house, then took some of her soap outside to finish cleaning my body and hair. Before I went inside, I walked to Grovier and cut him free of his harness, leaving a pile of hay and agave leaves for him to eat when I was gone. I tried to go, but I found I almost couldn't leave the poor, stupid thing. I wrapped my arms around his big, wet face and crushed it against my chest relishing the scratch of his fur against my skin and crying, despite myself. He was, after all, the only real family I had left. I dressed in Maria's clothing inside my house, taking care to not get it dirty. To her credit, the girl had packed an assortment of clothing that wasn't an idiotic, virginal white. I put on a pair of her dark riding pants, a matching blouse, and found a complimentary dark jacket and gloves and boots. I cleaned my feet with the sheets from my dead parents' bed, the mud there being the only thing the storm couldn't wash away, and put on the boots, and left. I drove myself to the train station in Guadalajara, not knowing in the least what would happen when I got there. The storm had died down while I dressed, until it was little more than a fine mist and the distant thunderclaps and splitting bursts of lightning. I rode toward town and gave the first trustworthy man I saw a few hundred pesos to take me to the train station on the tickets I dug out of Marie's purse. He didn't ask any questions, and, after he got me there, he jumped down from the driver's seat and disappeared without a word. A concierge was waiting for Maria on the platform, and when I told him that, yes, I was Doña Maria Martinez, he smiled and bowed and showed me to the train. I had worn one of Maria's dark, wide-brimmed hats low over my eyes, favoring him with a shy, coquettish smile and 
touching the swell of belly showing through my clothes. I suppose the rumor of Don Bejo's pregnant daughter was well enough known in Guadalajara that I didn't bear much of a second look. With her father's reputation, the impudence of a second glance may have been more risk than anybody thought worthwhile. So I boarded the train as Maria Martinez, wearing the woman's clothes and wondering behind which of the dark, distant hills I had buried her. I gave birth to your mother in America about six months later. I told people at the boarding school to call me Abella because the growing notoriety of the Martinez crime family in Guadalajara made it somewhat unsafe to be Maria Martinez. I named your mother Rachel, and she was beautiful. I sent pictures of her to her grandfather in Mexico, who wrote me letters and promised to visit just as soon as he quelled the violence with the neighboring gangs. Paolo had disappeared with some whore, Himadora, who lived on their land, leaving him in a bad situation. Paolo had been in control of the family's army of killers and assassins before he vanished, and hadn't left an effective chain of command in his place. He also apologized to me for my brother's iniquities, but promised he would do everything in his power to ensure nobody ever knew the truth of what happened. He said I would be returned to Mexico someday and married to a respectable man, and my daughter would be legitimized as part of that. I wrote him constantly, thanking him and keeping up with the family gossip, all of which I knew from my nightly talks with Paolo. I told him about my studies and how I was learning to speak English, and I joked that one day my daughter could be the American president because she was born here. He didn't appreciate that as much, but generally the man treated me like the daughter he didn't know he'd lost. In two years, I went from knowing almost no mathematics and absolutely no English to being at the top of most of my classes. You might find that extraordinary because I was an absolute bumpkin and no account before going there, but you must understand, these girls who had become my peers were weak-willed pink things from soft families. Me? I was a woman who, at 13, had fucked and murdered my way off an agave farm in Jalisco to a posh boarding school in America. I did all this while carrying a child and never... Not once, missing a harvest. My palms were so calloused, they made the other girls nervous when I shook their hands. When the headmistress tried to scold me for breaking some norm I had no time for, I would fix them with a stare that chilled them to the bone. When a man from the state of Texas came and told me they'd take my child, your mother, my first and only daughter, from me when her grandfather was arrested, I slapped that man so hard he had to spit the fake gold tooth I knocked free into his hand. Yes, grandson. In two years I learned to speak the language of the Americas as fluently as I spoke Spanish. In three more years I'd learned nearly as much Latin, as well as every bone, muscle, ligament, and vein in the human body. Three years after that, when I was cutting into my first body on an anatomy table in the state of Massachusetts, I thought for the first time almost since that night of when I butchered Maria and Paolo. I said a silent prayer and thanks to them just as I said little prayers to the agaves sometimes with your great-grandfather. Those plants are sacred, you understand, and have been since long before that land was called Jalisco or Mexico or anything at all. They are difficult to cultivate, difficult to cut and harvest, but this harvesting is the lifeblood of the Himador. Just as I harvested those agave, I harvested Maria, Paolo, my mother, and my father. But, of course, you are wondering what became of the fifth mark. How did I get it? I had wondered for a long, long time at what I had traded to Sombrero and what I had gotten in turn. He asked for five sacrifices, the matron, the patron, the stranger, the lover, and the fool. For a long while, I had confused myself as to whom I'd given him. Twelve years after I left my home in Jalisco, I returned. The great-grandfather had surrendered to the other crime syndicates in the region just years after I left. It was a gentle transition, all things considered. Don Bayo was a relic of the bootlegger days, ill-equipped to handle the banal cruelties of what was to come. They let him keep his tequila business, and so he did, though it turned a middling profit and his house remained in decline until his death. But the wars were over and the daughter he believed he'd never lost was now about to be a practicing doctor in America. 
His little granddaughter was twelve, and speaking with a hilariously bad American accent when she spoke to him over the phone. He believed my voice had simply changed as I finally matured into a woman. There were no soldiers on the property anymore, and we drove to the hacienda in a touring car with a convertible top. The agave fields remained ageless and blue beneath an azure sky. Only the foundations of my dead parents' home remained, though most of Grovier's pen still stood. I wept as I thought of the poor, wonderful animal and where he might have gone after I left. The driver attempted to comfort Doña Maria Martinez by handing me a handkerchief. I declined and smiled. Your great-grandfather was happy to see your mother. Unbelievably so, though he didn't much recognize the woman with him. I declined to introduce myself and instead went to the hacienda's kitchen to make drinks, leaving little Raquel to bounce on her grandfather's knee. He was in tears. But, as I said, I went to the kitchen. The staff there wasn't a quarter of what it was when I was a dirty little himadora dropping off piñas. Still... There was a woman who gladly brought me a bottle of the house tequila. I tasted it and found it no different than when I'd left. I realized that one or two of the last agaves I'd ever planted were probably in that bottle. A fitting ending, all things considered. I filled two glasses, poisoned one of them, and brought it back to Don Bello. Again, he had no idea who I was, to the point that he asked where Maria was. You really don't recognize me, I asked, taking off my hat and setting it on the table beside our drinks. I asked one of the house attendants to take my daughter on a tour of the grounds. Don Bello gave me a confused smile. Are you not an au pair? he asked. I laughed and crossed my legs, leaning back in the easy chair. We sat on the north patio of the hacienda, which provided a view of the grounds I had never seen before. The remains of my dead family's house were less than a collection of shadows in the distance, and all around us was agave in the Mexican countryside. I could even see Himadores working, which made colors swirl in the core of my chest. No, that's my daughter, I said. Isn't she beautiful? She has her father's eyes, unfortunately, but at least she doesn't have his smile. Or, God forbid, his laugh. Don Bello gave me a cold look, but realization dawned slowly over his face. You? A, a bea? The Himadora? He held his hands up in front of his face and looked at his palms. Then he looked over his shoulder. Is... Is this some sort of joke? Is... Is my son with you? Is Paolo with you? He was nearly in tears. What is going on? Paolo is dead. I told him. I'm sorry to say, but so is Maria. He blinked. Both of them died almost together twelve years ago. The woman whose room and board you paid for, whose schooling you paid for, that was me. I killed Maria and took her place. His face had gone pale. But the girl is your granddaughter. Paolo forced me into a relationship and we had a child together. Her. She's the one you've been speaking to on the phone. She's the one who has told you she loves you and has called you Grandpa all these years. God damn you, he whispered, his eyes wide. He knew by the set of my face I wasn't joking. This was no scam, no game. This was the world I had made for all of us to live in. The dirty little Himadora, his boy liked to fuck on the sly. Ah, have you killed? Arrested. I laughed in his face and took a sip of the tequila. It tasted like home. No, you won't. I said, You'll ruin her life, and she's all you have left. Don't think I'm being cruel forcing your hand like this. It's just the way things are. I sighed. I'm a doctor, and your granddaughter is going to live a life of luxury and success. She can be anything she wants in this life, and I gave that to her. I lowered my eyes at him. Maria? 
That little girl couldn't stand up to her own brother. I continued. My girl is the daughter of the woman who sits before you. The woman who can look into the eyes of Don Bayo Martinez and laugh. I pushed the glass I'd filled for him across the table and he looked at it. He seemed very old. You being alive is in the way of my daughter being happy, though, I told him. Your family can't be trusted with things like this, and these last threads need to be tied off. I pointed to the glass. It's poisoned. You'll go quickly, painlessly. It'll be the easiest death I've ever given somebody. He glared. But like anything in this life, it's a choice. I glared back at him. With consequences, as well, for not taking it. I raised my glass to him and downed it. He watched me with a sick expression. Spend the day with your granddaughter, I said, but just the day. I stood and left him alone in his great, empty house. You've earned that, at least. Your mother was heartbroken when they found her grandfather cold in bed the next morning. She would tell me, still tells me sometimes, that one day she spent with him was the most fun of her life. They went to the zoo in Guadalajara, and he took her around the tequila factory. I spent the day walking through the agaves, remembering a time when the leaves weren't so rough on my fingers. I found something in the dirt beside the house that I had long since forgotten, though I don't know how that's possible. It was rusted and dull, but I found the sharpening stick in the ruins of the shed and sat on the old foundations and honed the crescent to a point. I even managed to knock off most of the rust. And when I finished, it shone like a crescent moon in the sunlight. It took just a few hundred pesos of bribery to get the mortician to leave me alone with your grandfather's body. I wore gloves and a mask and apron for this one, but the process was just the same. His chest sprung open as I cut into it, the sad old flesh parting to reveal the ribs and the heart beneath. I thought that, even if the bribe didn't take, no man on earth would investigate why Don Bayo Martinez's daughter cut the heart out of his chest the night before his funeral. Your mother cried at the small service, and so did I, for that matter. It was a somber and very private affair. I didn't want to bother with the sparse, extended family that might recognize me as someone other than Maria, though my passport and every living document I owned proved I was. When all was done, I sold the hacienda and the tequila business and all the land and property in Don Bello's name. I have turned my back on Mexico forever even if you have not, despite your never having been there. The United States government might believe that moment came when I finished naturalizing myself, but that would be terribly inaccurate. I returned to my dead family's home one last time, carrying Don Bello's heart wrapped in parchment like a butcher's steak. Your mother and the driver stayed well out by the road, beyond where they could see what I was doing. I knelt beside the shadows and called for Sombrero, and he came. It's been a long time, <laughs> he said with a chuckle. Very, I said, holding out the heart. He held up a hand. Was a few seconds between old friends, eh? He said. His eyes were large and his teeth were deeply black though none of it was so frightening to me as the first time I saw him. You've accomplished quite a lot, little girl. I know, I told him. Oh, but do you? He asked, chuckling. Where once there stood a small girl, free of tethers, now stands a woman with a thousand cords, twisted in a single fist. Where I saw three fibers, three lives, three possibilities. Now is the great cable made of all the original paths. You, little girl, are a creature who kills babies. You have slain your other self 
and bound them to you, creating order. He slipped the heart of Don Beo Martinez, the last owner of these lands and fields, from my hands and held it in his own. In one of his other hands, he lifted a fistful of dust and showed both of them to me. Then he ate the heart and let the dust fall. Which is more honest? He asked me, after he finished chewing. I felt the sharp pain of the last cut scoring the flesh of my hand. His dark eyes narrowed. There are many other possibilities we've undone. Choices that can never be made now because of the pact you made. Worlds have ended. Universes have disappeared. And, I asked. He cackled so loudly I thought my daughter might hear. The sound penetrated the earth and my bones and shook the agaves. (laughs) <laughs> he repeated. Goodbye, Abeya. He motorita, doctor, mother, criminal. He smiled one last time. Keep an eye on your shadow and see that it stays lonely. Then his eyes disappeared and a score of rattlesnakes rushed out of the shadows between the old foundations which seemed not so deep as I'd thought. Though it may have been my imagination, one of the rattlesnakes lacked a head, but moved anyway. This story has no true end, because it's yours now, grandson. The story of why we became Americans, though I don't believe being an American is all that important in the end. But the story of how I killed my family to make my family ends like this. I stood alone amongst the agaves. They grew thick and tall where I grew up, sprouting from the ground like clusters of knives bigger than a child and as tall as some adults. I closed my eyes and listened to the sound of the wind, straining to hear the steady picking of somebody cutting away the leaves, searching for the heart. I thought of the pact I'd made with Sombrero, which you might believe is a silly name if you didn't know the original Spanish doesn't mean hat, but rather shadower. I wondered at what he'd asked me for, and who fulfilled the roles of the matron, the patron, the fool, the stranger, and the lover. And I wonder what I traded instead when I gave over my father's eye patch instead of a human heart. But in the end, I decided that none of it mattered. Death and pain are merely the wages of life, which bought me the most beautiful girl on earth. A girl who looks like every person who had to die to create her, and to secure her future. I thought of those things and more, and in time I knelt before the agaves and washed away the blood on the back of my hand with the dirt of those sacred fields. Then I turned my back on them, and I left. was Ojos Oscuros. What did you think? Have you ever made a great sacrifice to improve your life? Have you ever cut a deal with a little god of the Witchum to set the strands of reality itself in your favor? Let us know in the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club on Facebook. It's a place full of like-minded fans who talk about horror and literature and the show and whatever else comes to mind. They and I would love to hear from you. So hop on over to Facebook and search for the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club today. And while you're there, you can also follow our fan page by just searching West Side Fairy Tales. Or if Twitter is more your speed, you can get to me at WS Fairy Tales. If you like pictures of creepy stuff and rabbits and sometimes food, then go to Instagram and follow us at West Side Fairy Tales. Please consider heading to westsidefairytales.com slash merch and buying a souvenir of the show. We have t-shirts, hats, hoodies, and even mugs and stickers and other stuff, so head on by if you have a few bucks and you want to show your support. You can also choose to support us on Patreon, where just $1 gets you early access to all episodes. 
Higher tiers get you access to special episodes, super early raw releases of the show without ads or intros, and even free merch. Contributions from listeners help this show to continue providing free, high-quality content, and we really can't thank all of you who support us enough. For those of you interested in a deeper breakdown of this month's recommendations, Sandra Cisneros' House on Mango Street and Rec, directed by Jaime Balguero and Paco Plaza, tune in to the West Side Fairy Tales Horror and Lit Club episode that will be dropping on the feed in two weeks. In those episodes, I provide some in-depth discussion on their recommendations, some history of their creation, and talk about what they mean to me as a horror author and writer. Also, if you'd like to chat with me directly sometime, you can hop into my Sunday evening video game streams at twitch.tv slash westsidetyler. Right now I am streaming this uh, awesome fucked up game called Blasphemous. Pop on in and say hi. Join us next month for the story of a man traveling through the ruined landscape of a massive dead city. Corpse Metropolis, where he is both hunter and hunted. I hope you'll join us the first Friday of March for our story within as without. And until then, as always, stay safe out there. The West Side Fairy Tales is written, read, scored, and produced by Tyler Bell. Episode artwork by Yui Breedlove. All content here in copyright 2020, WSF Productions, LLC.